Over the last several days, I've been flooding the channel with videos with various heads of states, heads of government and top-level government officials talking about economics, geopolitics, and occasionally some disdainful purulent nonsense such as the President of Austria and the EU Commissioner for Regional Policy, all as part of something called the Three Seas Initiative Summit. Now, older subscribers know already why that sudden influx of videos happened and indeed many expected them. But since this channel got a new influx of subscribers recently, this might have been confusing, so perhaps an explanation is in order. But most important, it needs to be said that as an accredited journalist to such events, one gets to see and hear a lot of things that the general public never finds out about, simply because the accredited journalists generally tend to have a weak spine and don't broadcast most of these things. Well, that and the fact that many of the accredited journalists me and my partner met at the uh, event really should not have been there in the first place. Anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about in this episode. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. All right, <clears throat> for those who don't know anything about the Three Seas Initiative, please do watch the video published on this channel on May the 12th, 2017 called Intermarium, the coming Eastern European Union. Link is in the description. In the meantime, that video became the most popular on YouTube on this issue, even though I really didn't say anything new, but merely repackaged the ideas primarily expressed by Marek Chodakiewicz, uh, Pol the Polish-American historian and intellectual who's been pushing and pitching the idea of Intermarium for several years now. Now, at the moment when that video was taped, it wasn't yet clear that the modern day incarnation of the Intermarium would be this particular Three Seas Initiative or some other versions that have also been touted since 2014. This was all clarified several months later after I published that video by Donald Trump's historical speech in Warsaw, which in addition to getting the leftist media's knickers in a bunch, also accelerated the uh, efforts to building this project on all fronts and confirming that the Three Seas Initiative format will, for the time being, be the dominant version. Now it is important to keep in mind though that the point is the safeguarding of the Intermarium region and not what is the name of the political expression meant to achieve that at a certain point in time. Now I have to mention this for the same re reason I have to remind many people that the European Union is not Europe but merely a political expression of some parts of Europe which reality shows doesn't particularly work well. Anyway, I don't want to spend the time retelling the story of the Intermarium, so please do watch that video if you haven't done so already, just so you have some background on why all of this is happening. So, with that said, for the purposes of this video, the presentation is divided as follows. Number one, brief history. Two, thorough explanation of what you saw in the official videos. Three, all the things you and really most of the public did not get to see and here <clears throat> I will also answer some of the obvious questions that not only the audience of this channel asked but the public in general asked and the big respectable media well failed to answer. Uh, number four a few anecdotes about the press corps you're probably not going to like that one and finally number five conclusions and what to expect in the near future. So the brief history is well brief. Uh, since the 2015 migrant crisis, things shifted on this continent, not in a massive way as some alarmist cathedral media journalists would have you believe, but some things did indeed change. One of those things is the increased willingness of more and more individuals, including at the highest political levels, that, to acknowledge that there is a fundamental difference in thought and pattern of looking at the world between the Intermarium, or Central and Eastern Europe if you want, and the rest of Europe. 
Now, this difference doesn't come exclusively from recent history. After all, Austria is more or less part of the Intermarium and they don't have the experience of having communism imposed upon them via Russian tanks. But it comes from a collection of historical facts, traditions and experience. Anyone who has traveled enough through Europe uh, notices this almost immediately. The more experienced the traveler, the easier it gets to notice this. The 2015 migrant crisis just revealed that once again, this time on a scale that simply had not happened since the end of the Cold War. It just simply is the case that in the Intermario most of the people continue to instinctively reject the core tenets of the modern left and continues to insist that prosperity can indeed be achieved without a significant chunk of laws and policies that are still colloquially referred to as part of modernity even though they've wrecked havoc wherever they have been implemented. Now as a side note, the veracity of that understanding of things has just been reconfirmed just a few days ago when with Poland's economy now being rated as fully developed or highly developed, whatever, thus further proving that prosperity can indeed be achieved without redefining family, marriage, biology, borders, nationhood, faith, and many other of the uh, fundamental elements of any civilization, really. In any event, in the midst of that realization in 2015, the idea to get a more formal and concrete outlet for this state of affairs started to be acknowledged one intermarium state at a time. So by the summer of 2016, the first Three Seas Initiative Summit takes place in Croatia, but then something better happens. Trump gets elected and his administration answers even more positively than previous ones to this idea. And to make sure there are no misunderstandings, uh, Donald Trump in person travels to Warsaw in 2017 for the second Three Seas Initiative, giving the whole uh, project a huge political boost and indeed a very much needed one. So, sure, the leftist press didn't quite like it, but it's not like anyone asked for their approval. And as I said last year during the video I recommended you watch earlier, this isn't something that the media has to approve because it's mainly about military and economics and it's a lot less centralized than many would, many would imagine or indeed fear. So it's enough if the deep state in every interbarium country agrees, roughly speaking, on certain things. During the Warsaw summit of last year, relevant actors from all participating states insisted upon faster economic cooperation, higher military spending and, of course, stronger actions towards blocking Gazprom's monopoly on energy, an issue that is quite pressing for most of Europe and in the Intermarium, pressing for all uh, participating states uh, except Croatia and Romania, which have their own sources and supplies of energy. Since then, <clears throat> Since, after, since the uh, second uh, Intermarium summit in Warsaw last year, we saw the military spending growth rate in the Intermarium essentially skyrocket, with the highest in the world being in Romania and close second in Poland. Likely in 2019, the roles will be reversed as Poland is preparing even more nice things on the military front, but more on that later. So that's basically where the Three Seas Initiative thingy is coming from. I try to be brief. Obviously, we can quibble about the details, but that's not the purpose of this video. Now, let's go to point number two and try to explain, well, basically the previous seven videos. So, in accordance with what was discussed last year in Poland, this year the summit took place in Bucharest and also included a business forum, which will become an annual feature from now on. Myself, alongside with my partner from the Romanian Language Channel, were two of the over 300 accredited journalists at this event, which took place on September the 17th and the 18th in two locations in Bucharest. The first day was exclusively dedicated to the business forum, whilst the second day the officials were mostly at the presidential palace, while the business forum continued at the first location during the second day as well. Basically, there was no way for us, just two individuals, to cover everything during the second day but we had some help. The Chamber of Commerce, alongside with another non-leftist journalist from another publication who chose to stick with the business forum in the second day and forego the <clears throat> heads of state meetings, were kind enough to keep us in the loop in sort of real time with what was going on at the other location. So basically, we had this covered in the best 
possible way. And we learned that after we left Bucharest and started looking on how bigger publications had this covered. And with two or three exceptions, everyone else's coverage and knowledge was distinctly inferior. So in a way, you know, I'm quite proud of this. Anyway, so in the first day we, and then you all on this channel, got to hear several things from several heads of states and representatives. First, we heard the president of Croatia coming with a very concise poem learned from home about the infrastructure. But then more interesting was the president of Poland who stressed about the dangers of Nord Stream 2 and insisted on the issue of energy diversification with the implication that the local Three Seas initiative slash Intermarium business community being necessary to play a bigger role in this. This was not only a jab at Germany, which is, well, self-evident, but also a jab at the Baltic states, particularly Estonia, whose energy market is one of the least free in the world. Only Russia, Azerbaijan and more recently Venezuela have less free energy markets. Believe it or not, Estonian energy market is less free even when compared to Saudi Arabia or Qatar. The message was taken very well, but you wouldn't know that from reading the newspapers because around two thirds of the press corps accredited to the event had no idea what I just said even means. <sighs> anyway, more on that a bit later. Anyway, so <laughs> after, after Mr. Andrzej Duda, uh, whose presence at the summit was basically him gathering the latest ideas in the region so he can deliver them to President Trump the next day, which by the way, he did and did very well. So uh, anyway, after President Duda, up on the podium went Corina Kretsu, EU Commissioner for Regional Policy, speaking on behalf of Jean-Claude Juncker, who was probably too drunk to show up in time, so he landed much later in the evening and missed the first day of the business forum. Anyway, Anyway, whether Corina Grezzo spoke her own mind or indeed merely relayed the message she had gotten from Jean-Claude Juncker, the fact of the matter remains that outright lies came out of her mouth. And for the sake of accuracy, let's play the excerpt. Principalul mesaj al Comisiei Europene este acela de mare apreciere față de această inițiativă a celor trei mări. Știți foarte bine cu ocazia discursului său privind starea Uniunii Europene de săptămâna trecută, președintele Juncker a subliniat că își dorește să facem eforturi mai mari pentru a apropia estul și vestul Europei, atât la nivelul Comisiei Europene, cât și la nivelul statelor membre, iar inițiativa celor trei mări vine tocmai în sprijinul acestui obiectiv comun. Este o inițiativă foarte relevantă și legitimă, contribuie la dezvoltarea regională, amplificând astfel procesul de coeziune la nivelul întregii Uniunii Europene. Comisia Europeană susține obiectivul comun al șefilor de state și de guverne de a identifica proiecte comune și, și sprijinim acest, aceste proiecte în domeniul energiei, transporturilor și tehnologiilor digitale. Încurajăm realizarea unor proiecte transnaționale în aceste domenii. That, my fellow deplorables, is an outright lie. The Brussels bureaucrats, including Corina Crezu personally and the European Commission as a whole, have been doing everything they could to undermine the Intermarium as a whole, as well as individual Intermarium countries. I mean, how should I put this? It's really funny for Corina Crezu and the next day Jean-Claude Juncker himself to stand there all smiley and shit writing uh, right next to Andrzej Duda and Mateusz Morawiecki the next day, right as the European Commission apparatus is trying to blackmail Poland into not purging its judiciary from the old guard commies who've been keeping the country hostage. So please, give me a freaking break, European Commission, come on. The idea that the EU is thrilled with the Three Seas Initiative is like Obama would tell me he is thrilled Trump is president. It's that kind of an egregious and patently obvious lie. Things hit an all-time low for the entire summit, really, when the speech of the Austrian president Alexander van der Bellen happened, who at times appeared rather senile, though I would never suspect him of that, but rather of ill intent. Let us not forget that the current Austrian president is an extremist of the far left of Soviet descent, a radical type of which, thankfully, they no longer manufacture them today. I mean, the quote-unquote modern left is pretty damn radical, but van der Bellen is a whole different ballgame 
up on that ladder. In any event, van der Bellen represented the far-left pro-Russian view of the Three Seas Initiative, a view that is highly dangerous in basically all respects. The good news is that the policy of Austria is not made by the president, but rather the government, which at this point is ra ran by well, slightly less insane people. I still do have my reservations regarding Chancellor Kurtz, particularly in matters of foreign policy, which are relevant to this talk, but I'll take Chancellor Kurtz over the radical leftist that calls himself President of Austria any day of the week. The official day, but not the summit day itself, ended in a better note with the speech of Mr. Ian Steff, or Ian Steff, Assistant Secretary of Commerce representing the Trump administration. And here's the thing. At this event, there were two types of journalist accreditation, the so-called official media, which technically was reserved for state-owned media, and, well, everyone else. With two exceptions, us and another Romanian magazine, nobody in the press corps thought it to be a good idea to make connections with some of the other type of press pass. And it mattered, because after the first day of the business forum, there was a more private meeting in which the actual machinations were discussed. I know a thing or two about what happened there, because I bothered to ask. Most of the press? Well, they didn't seem to care. And then they wondered why their own public turned against them. <laughs> anyway, in the second day, at the political half of the summit, which was of most interest for us, there were basically two events. One was the plenary session, where the media's access was limited to say the least, and then the final statement, which you have seen in the previous videos, where we weren't allowed to ask questions. Terrible! Anyway, I had a little list of questions that I wanted to ask, but I guess I'll take the list with me next year. Maybe the Slovenian organizers will be more open to the media. Maybe. In any event, aside from revealing the next year's organizer, there are a few things to remember from the official statements of the, next, of the second day. First, the atrocious idea of inviting Germany to this whole thing, and I have to say this was the idea of the dumb plant that is sometimes known as President of Romania. Johannes had, in 2014 when he was elected, the main advantage of not being a bloody commie. That's why he won. But his rampant pro-German bias has been a negative feature throughout his term. The worst, the worst part is how come uh, President Duda, or indeed Prime Minister Morawiecki, were unable to see this and block his stupid idea. <sighs> Amazing. Secondly, it should be remembered the part where Juncker took a strong jab at the United Kingdom. Why? Well, because he's Juncker, that's why. The summit had nothing to do with the UK or Brexit in general. In fact, I don't think anyone even mentioned the United Kingdom, except in one phrase about military cooperation, and also Mrs. Kitarovic mentioned that rich neighborhood in London as the richest area of the European Union. But that's pretty much it. I mean, it was really not related to Brexit or the United Kingdom, like, at all. But Juncker found it necessary to take a jab at it. Sadly, the media missed this moment, except for a low-tier uh, tabloid in the United Kingdom. But one of the reasons this happened is because the media's access to that plenary session was limited. But I caught that moment on camera from the press room where they had us stuffed and where we were supposed to watch the feed, except the feed was less than stable and then got cut off entirely just as Miss Grybauskaite, the president of Lithuania, was about to take the floor. Anyway, here's the Juncker's moment taking a jab at the United Kingdom. Is the very big in Europe in the past 
for men of clothes and in my country, but nobody knows that this is leading in the national language of the time we come here, this will be working in that language. And everywhere. Mes chers amis, j'ai toujours pensé que l'Europe commandée devrait respirer avec ses deux poumons, l'Est et l'Ouest. Si elle ne fait pas ça, elle perd son, son souffle. Really, mate? Luxembourgish being spoken in Sibiu? <laughs> now, I understand when you lie about policy, that's kind of your job, but this is just dumb. Anyway, the trouble is that although the plenary session was supposed to be public, well, it kind of really wasn't. We, as accredited journalists, were given only three minutes into the chambers, and this is the footage I was able to get, which, by the way, it is better than many other journalists whose gear was more complicated to set up, and as a result, they got zero seconds. And as I said earlier, the feed we were supposed to get exclusive access to was unstable, had crappy sound, and eventually got cut off entirely long before the plenary session ended. So yeah, I guess this counts as thorough enough explanation of what you saw in the official video. Now, let's get to point number three and tell you what the public did not get to see and hear. So, first of all, let me answer the obvious question asked by everyone, including myself, in the first uh, log uh, we taped at the event. So, here's me asking it. The answer is as follows. Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova were invited and did attend. They were referred to in the official speeches as the Eastern Partnership States. I learned this about two hours after I taped the segment from which I quoted a few seconds ago when, walking down the hallway preparing the cameras for the arrivals of the heads of state, I quite literally stumbled upon a member of the Ukrainian government. He didn't want to give uh, an interview, but had no problem going out for a few cigarettes and a small chat. My Ukraine cap and my language skills might have helped a little bit. I mean, I'm just saying, because nobody from the Eastern Partnership was keen on speaking with the media. In any event, what I learned from the high-ranking officials of Georgia and Ukraine is basically this. They are at an impasse. The Ukrainian deep state is split on this issue, and in Georgia the political will is on board, but geography doesn't exactly help. And while Georgia, as you have seen on this channel um, last year during my Georgia-Armenia tour, so while Georgia clearly is intermarium material, both in civilizational and geopolitical terms, it is still quite far away as far as the current state of the initiative goes. This year's summit was exceptionally focused on economic development, and as you've heard the leaders talking, particularly Andrzej Duda and Kolinda Kitarovic, Georgia cannot, geographically speaking, be part of the current focus, which is north to south connectivity or interconnectivity. Now, Georgia is not on the Via Carpathia route, it is not on the Constanza Gdansk railway, nor on the Danube, so I guess the only aspect where they could contribute would be on the seaside transportation of things. Now, this will be my recommendation for the next year, for Georgia to shill its relationship with Azerbaijan and pitch a safer transport road from the port of Batumi to Constanza and then the goods to be transported via railway or on the Danube to the rest of the Three Seas Initiative area. This is particularly relevant in the field of energy, Georgia enjoying a privileged relationship that bypasses Russia and thus would help with the overall Three Seas Initiative goal of energy diversification. Again, you haven't read that in the newspapers because most of the accredited journalists had no idea why they were there. Again, more on that later. Another aspect that nobody in the media talked about was the presence of Albanian, Montenegrin and Macedonian companies in the relevant fields at the Business Forum. This is a big deal, because as I've told you in the video about post-communism in Albania, there's plenty of untapped energy potential off the coast of Albania, which could also help with the energy diversification goal on the southwestern side of the Intermarium, particularly Montenegro, which is still indirectly relying on Russian gas, and of course, Bulgaria, whose vulnerability to Russian whims were fully revealed back in 2014. For those who may not remember, 
Putin cut the gas supply in January 2014. We didn't actually notice that in Romania, well, the civilian population at the very least didn't notice, because this country has enough energy to be fully independent for several decades. But a bit south and into Sofia, well, civilians were kind of freezing in their apartments, and that is kind of terrible. Now, to my pleasant surprise, many of the businessmen and government officials were fully aware of these things, but at the same time were very happy uh, that they refused to give, an in to give me an interview on the record, because, well, as they said, quote, it would be quite problematic to explain these things on public record for the time being, close quote. And seriously, that's an actual quote uh, from a political official in Montenegro. Now, Quite frankly, I don't blame them. Politically speaking, this is difficult, especially in a democracy, which is why this will have to be kept in check to be focused only on military and infrastructure, because these are the things that even in democracies are kind of left outside the democratic mandate, which they should be. Such matters are simply too important to be left exclusively at the passions of the moment. Now, if you don't believe me, check out what happened in eastern Poland and eastern Romania at the beginning of the shale gas revolution several years ago. The Kremlin got a full chance to exploit the democratic process and infiltrate a bajillion agitators. Now, thankfully, um, lefty environmentalist claptrap doesn't really resonate with the average Pole or the average Romanian, but it did work in other places. So that's why I agree with the people I spoke with at the business forum that this should, for now, be kept exclusively on the so-called politically neutral fields, where national security concerns still apply and are thus paramount to politics. The third thing that I should mention is that the van der Bellen type of discourse was essentially rejected, almost unanimously, which is great because next year people like me will pitch for Chancellor Kurtz to be invited to represent Austria at the summit. Now, from a protocol perspective, this can't really be done because it's a summit where heads of state are to be given priority and prime ministers or chancellors are to come only if the heads of state cannot come. Now, with that said, I say, well, protocol be damned. Let's get the actual policymaker next year and spare everyone, including accredited journalists, of another pro-Soviet pitch. Please, pretty please. I'm almost willing to beg the Slovenian president for this to happen. Oh, speaking of the Slovenian president, it should be noted that nobody was able to find out why some of the heads of state were not on the stage, even though they were present at the summit. And I'm talking here particularly about the president of Lithuania, whose views nobody got to hear, but also the president of Slovenia and Slovakia. It is of less importance that we didn't get to hear the president of Hungary, whose name nobody really knows, and whose relevance in both Hungarian politics and foreign policy is comparable to a plant. I mean, with all due respect to Janos Ader, but the president of the Hungarian Chamber of Commerce had more relevance to this summit than the Hungarian president. And if I had stumbled upon Janos Ader, the first thing coming out of my mouth after saying hello would have been, okay, so where is Mr. Orban? Was he too busy to attend? <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> the point of this segment is to basically inform you that behind the scenes this summit went better than it was seen from the official statements. And if 10% of the agreed-upon projects are accomplished within the next two years, we could even call this summit a phenomenal success. And this may indeed happen, depending on how fast the political power moves to make the accommodations. And by that I mean, of course, cutting back some of those bloody regulations. I mean. Nobody on the stage spoke about the problem of regulations, but once the microphones were off and the video cameras out of the chamber, phrases containing regulations and problem were very often spoken. And that was for a very good reason. All right, now let's go to point number four and give you some anecdotes, or perhaps little stories born out of my own frustration at this event. <laughs> Essentially, <clears throat> I had some of my worst fears about the media reconfirmed at this event. So this is why I routinely laugh when I see individuals peddling conspiracies about the media. Yes, the media for the most part sucks, and yes, it's full of leftists, and yes, they often lie or mislead. But that's not necessarily because they're engaged in some sort of a conspiracy, but rather because they really are idiots. 
Now, sure, some important figures in the media know exactly what they're doing and are quite far from being idiots, but for the most part it's stupidity and or mediocrity that drives the media into the terrible state that it is today. As said in the opening, of the 300 accredited journalists, it is my view that at least two-thirds of them perhaps should not have been there. And I know this is horrible to say because, well, freedom of the press and all of that, but I'm not saying the publication X or Y should not have been allowed in. I'm saying those specific individuals should not have been there because they were too dumb for this event. Or maybe I'm too old and I simply have a standard that is from a different era. That's possible too. But where, whichever it may be, I still find it shocking, now almost two weeks since the event, that an accredited journalist to an international event with geopolitical implications doesn't know what the midterms are, or who the president of Austria is. I mean, seriously. Someone asked me, who is this guy, while van der Bellen was talking. And that someone was from a media institution that spends in 10 minutes more money than this channel's yearly budget. I just don't think you, as a media institution, large or small, should send a journalist to an event about which that said journalist quite literally knows nothing about. One of the objectives uh, we had on this summit was to forge connections with media from other intermarium countries because in-person connections tend to last longer and forge better collaboration. It turned out that my objective was much harder to fulfill because there was almost nobody to talk to. Sure, there were a few exceptions, much regards to the team sent by Hrvatska Televizija, for instance, and not because they interviewed me, but because their leading reporter actually knew what he was talking about. He was spectacularly well informed about the internal politics of every intermarium country. He wanted to know details from me about Romanian politics, but his questions were very specific and detailed, nothing like you'd expect from your usual ignorant journal. So much respect uh, for him, that guy definitely should have been there. But aside from these uh, notable but still few exceptions, most of the press corps was quite frankly atrocious. And while I can't hold the gossip type of press too much uh, to a much of a standard, I did have slightly higher expectations from certain institutions. Obviously, I was wrong. I found a tabloid journalist who was much smarter than the representative from Deutsche Welle. If you feel the world of media is upside down, well, that could be because it actually is upside down. And again, I'm not saying this out of disappointment, far from it. I'm only saying it as a confirmation. The worst things I said in the past about the media are not just true, but double plus true, if you want. The level of incompetence is utterly astonishing. And again, the press corps had representatives from almost all major institutions in Europe and beyond, so it's not like I had a sampling of local TV stations or tabloids from Romania, no, no, no. I got one hell of a diverse sampling, and by div but diverse only in terms of geography, because in terms of incompetence, there wasn't much diversity. <clears throat> and I'm not even remotely the most competent journalist in the world. Heck, 99% of the time, I don't even dare to call myself a journalist, even though I've been doing this for quite some time, longer than I've been on YouTube. But goodness me. After meeting the quote-unquote true journalists, I definitely have a renewed commitment to what I'm doing on this channel. No wonder the cathedral is trying to censor us. The talk about radicalization and all that crap is just smokes and mirrors. The fact of the matter is we're getting more eyeballs than the traditional media simply because we are more competent than they are. Sure, it wasn't always like that, but it damn is right now. The few smart folks in the press corps at the summit were not surprised at all to see a YouTube channel amongst the accredited press corps. Some of them were surprised that there isn't more than one YouTube channel at the event. Meanwhile, the rest of the press corps was shocked that we even exist. How could this even be? Some of them really asked. And that's solely because the traditional media has been hiding behind procedures and lawyers in their attempt to maintain their grip on primary news about politics. To get into governmental buildings, access has been loosened now to make room for people like us too, but the traditional media apparently doesn't know it. So when they see a YouTube channel among them, they are shocked. 
Well, I'm glad I was able to shock them and I hope I'll shock them again next year. All right, speaking of next year, let's get to the final point, conclusions. Overall, this was a pleasant experience. We got access to people we could not otherwise get in one single place. We expanded our network a little bit and we got to check our beliefs about the media against reality. Now, sadly, the, the outcome doesn't look good on the media in general, but hey, life is imperfect. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> I fully do intend to be among the accredited journalists next year in Slovenia, partly because Freedom Alternative now has friends over there and partly because the expectations are now higher on the Three Seas Initiative and if they are met, I would like to be there to witness it myself because as this summit proved quite conclusively to me, I cannot and you cannot rely on the traditional media to tell the whole story. Sure there will be logistical issues. It's a 16-hour train ride from here to Ljubljana with a night in Budapest, but after all, we did travel 10 hours by train from here to Bucharest for this year's summit, so we'll endure it, for the sake of the truth and more honest reporting. I mean, someone's gotta do it. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> the next video will be about the geopolitics of Slovenia. Now I know I've been promising that one for quite some time, but ultimately I'm glad I didn't get around to doing it until now because now I can tie it with the Three Seas Initiative narrative and will thus increase its relevance. With that video, I will conclude the reporting on the Three Seas Initiative for this year. But that video will have to wait though because soon enough I'll board the plane and head towards the Middle East for the much announced and scheduled Jordan Israel tour. I've already booked two interviews with very interesting people, both of them quite known. I will keep their identities under wraps for now because I want it to be a surprise. I also looked, it, uh, looked into going to visit Israel's equivalent of the NRA and some other uh, interesting places. I really have, I really have decent expectations for uh, this Middle Eastern tour. Basically, there will be a lot of work for me in the Middle East so I can bring you the best content this tiny, very, very small budget can offer. <laughs> now, speaking of the budget, many, many, many thanks to all those who donated specifically for these two endeavors, the Intermarium Summit and the Jordan-Israel Tour, especially the latter, which stood under doubt almost till the very end. Many thanks for those who donated for, for the last minute uh, drive. You are all awesome and probably I'm not thanking you uh, often enough. Most of the things I did on and for this channel would have never happened without your continuous and generous support. Anyway, while I'm away as usual I may or may not publish impromptu videos from there depending on the internet connection I'll get but the intention is to publish a few short videos. So uh, with all of that being said, Thank you all for watching this longer video. I hope it's been informative. Apologize for the lightning, but uh, it's a bit in a rush. I have less than 48, 48 hours until I have to board the plane and go to Middle East. Please do subscribe uh, to my social media. If you derive any value from the work uh, we do here, please do consider throwing a shekel my way. I will need literally shekels while in Israel for the next week or so. And I guess I'll see you all soon on the Freedom Alternative.